Thank you. Hold slide. Uh, Dr. Cheng. I'd like to thank you, uh, thank all the organizers for persevering through the pandemic and reorganizing this wonderful conference in a virtual format. I've been asked to give uh, two talks. Uh, the first one will be something I think resonates with a lot of providers in the NICU, and that is how do you predict outcome? So given the time limits, I won't have any cases to go through to specifically illustrate, but I wanted to share with you my uh, concept and approach which has worked for me in the NICU and from the feedback I get from our NICU social workers, bedside nurses, and most uh, importantly, the parents and families themselves seems to work. So, um, on. got nothing to disclose. The objectives I wanna to touch on are to one, identify common neonatal neurologic emergencies and their subsequent injuries in the developing brain is if you don't know which of your babies are brain injured, you can't actually say with a high degree of confidence that that child will be normal, much less have a good. Describe the relationship between location of injury or anatomy and functional issues or disabilities. Review the neurologic assessment of a newborn at high risk of brain injury, in particular, the acute assessment. So let's start with the concept of brain injury in a developing brain. Um, as a neurologist, I recognize most of us are visual learners. And so here you see what a 24-week brain looks like versus a 40-week brain. And you can see how vastly different they are, not only in size and volume, but in sulcation pattern. If you look at it histologically, you can also see the exponential amount of synaptic connections that are occurring in the first two years of life. So for me as a neurologist, when I step into NICU, there are not two populations of preemie and term infants, but there's actually about three, really four different age groups. And so insults and injuries cannot be viewed the same uh, without the context of understanding the age of the patient, i.e. the developmental stage of the brain. Another way to look at brain um, uh, injury is to think about it in a three-dimensional way. So here's an illustration of what the ventricles look like in the first, second, and third trimester. And you can see how much the shape and morphology of the ventricles are changing in the three trimesters. The shape and morphology of the ventricles change depending on the varied proliferation and therefore the folding of the cerebrum as it progresses through pregnancy and gestational age. And therefore, one should think about brain injury in the newborn, not just in terms of do you, when of having had injury, but when in this spectrum of time course of conception to birth and beyond that that brain injury occurred. And that depending on where in the time point of brain development, you would expect different structural or maturational changes to be affected. And that could affect brain development, brain maturation, and even um, brain growth. It's also a, a natural prejudice mm -hmm. that we think of brain injuries as just second and third trimester events and recognize that you, one can be predestined to have brain problems in terms of genetic mutations that occur and are there even before conception. But obviously a lot of gene errors or mutations can also occur in the first trimester and then you have to make it through second and third trimester and then go through the gauntlet of labor and delivery. And when you think about it in that fashion, it's actually surprising that more of us aren't brain injured. And it philosophically, you can ask the question, are any of us actually truly born without some brain injury? When you think about common neonatal neurologic emergencies, this is like the most common uh, top you know, categories. And most common are the vascular events, whether hypoxic ischemic insult, intracranial hemorrhages, or cerebral vascular accidents. But whether it's something that happens to the baby or something that is inherent to the baby, a newborn is pretty limited in its phenotypic expression of having brain problems. 
The most common are an altered mental state or encephalopathy, seizures, and or hypotonia. So that our job as neurologists is to elucidate what underlying etiology is causing the encephalopathy, seizures, and hypotonia. So for example, if we just look at seizures in itself, you can see there's a pretty um, long list of differentials uh, for what can cause seizures. Seizures in a newborn, unlike in other age groups, are predominantly because of something that happened to the baby, meaning an acute symptomatic event. And so um, nine out of 10 times, if you have a newborn seizing, particularly in a tertiary NICU, that will be because of something happening to the baby's brain, as in the form of hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, stroke, or, uh, or hemorrhages. Less than 10% of the time is that seizure the initial manifestation of the newborn's epilepsy. And that can be because of CNS malformations, genetic etiologies. And this holds true no matter which way you ask the question of neonatal seizures, whether it's looking at clinical seizures or EEG confirmed seizures, or whether it's a single center study or a multi-center study throughout the decades, if you guess a vascular event in the form of HIE, hemorrhage, or cerebral vascular accidents, you will be right two thirds of the time. So if you have a newborn seizing, it shouldn't be just about treating the seizures. You should be asking why did that baby seize because you will be right in saying that it was some type of vascular event two thirds of the time and 90% it's because something happened acutely to the baby. So in review, key concepts of brain injury, one brain injury or issues can occur before birth. They don't, time a zero is not actually birth. Most of us probably sustain some brain injury during pregnancy or delivery. You don't actually know if your newborn patient isn't brain injured if you haven't examined or checked for it. And a newborn with seizures means something is not normal about their brain. Let's go to the concept of how to predict prognosis. And to do that, I have to describe the relationship between location of injury or anatomy and functional outcomes. So I think no matter where in the world you went to medical school, we all had a medical school lecture that was titled, Where's the Lesion? Meaning that you needed to know your neuroanatomy to be able to localize it to the peripheral or central nervous system. And if in the central nervous system, there was a horizontal and vertical axis, and that once you understood that anatomy, you should then from the neurologic exam be able to localize where the lesion is. Therefore, I, as a child neurologist, spent a whole year as our requirement in the US doing adult neurology where all we did was the neuro exam. And from the abnormalities that you found in the neuro exam, which is a functional test, that you would then localize where the lesion is. The brain MRI was to confirm what you knew from exam um, as to where the lesion occurred. I realized when I stepped in the NICU, um, you know, back in 2004, that I had to practice my neurology backwards from what I was taught. In fetal and neonatal neurology, you need to give me a brain image where I can see the lesion. And from the lesion, I'm supposed to predict what your exam should look like in two, five, or 10 years. And so that identifying injury is, is not just about whether you're brain injured or not, but knowing exactly where the injury is and then being able to characterize the severity of injury in that region to then predict what functional issues they, that newborn will have and to what severity. Expanding on this concept, I tend to think of the brain in different ways. So one, in terms of the cerebrum, I tend to think of it as like states. You have the frontal lobe, occipital lobe, different parts of the brain if there is cortical injury, will have different functional issues because your frontal lobe is, does different things from your occipital or your temporal lobe. This sort of mapping occurs in other parts of our brain, such as the homunculus that we all know about in our primary motor and sensory area. And this is why perinatal strokes that involve primarily MCA territory give you hand issues but you can still walk because that is not part of MCA territory. 
That homunculus is also seen in the cerebellum. You have a visual field homunculus that is mapped out to your primary visual cortex. And so again, understanding that different parts of the cerebrum have different functional issues. And if you know this mapping well, then you should understand what modality of function has a potential of being impacted depending on if the injury is in these different states of the brain. Taking the analogy to another level, not only do you have states, but you have highways or telephone wires connecting the neurons in these different cortical areas to other regions of the brain or to the body itself. And you need to know these major highways or telephone cabling to understand that you can have a disruption in that function without having any injury to the cortex, but because you've disrupted the cable of fibers that would carry those functional um, uh, those functions. So for example, the cortical spinal tracts or motor, knowing that the uh, fiber tracts that go through the anterior portion of the corpus callosum are connecting different lobes versus the posterior portion of the corpus callosum. And then in terms of vision, that you don't need to have vision affected with only uh, injury to the primary visual cortex if you injure the optic radiations, whether the superior or inferior radiations on their way to the primary visual cortex, that you may get visual impact as the uh, si similar way as actually injuring the cortical ribbon in the occipital lobe or the primary visual cortex. I use the analogy of describing the subcortical gray matter in the form of control panels or hubs so that you have the control panel for motor function in your basal ganglia, and therefore having um, significant injury to your basal ganglia as you can have um, with hypoxic ischemic insults to bilateral basal ganglia, then you can confidently say to the family that your child will have cerebral palsy because they will have motor manifestations. And again, if it's of a moderate severe level, it should persist beyond a year of life and therefore be a a lifelong issue. The thalamus I sort of describe as being a master control panel to the house. So for example, if you have a direct injury to your thalamus and it's more than just a mild amount, that would be very similar to having a direct insult to the control panel in your house. So even if your power plant is working and the uh, cable of wires from the power plant your house is intact, and the wiring in your house is intact, if your control panel is injured, you're not gonna have any electricity running through your house. Recognize that the thalamus itself is like a mini brain. Different nuclei within the thalamus actually connect and map out to different cerebral areas. And so that if you had, again, diffuse, moderate or severe insult to your thalamus, even if your whole cerebrum, your cortical ribbon, and your uh, deep white matter are intact. If your thalamus is significantly injured, you can have as severe of an insult um, or functional uh, effects as you would as if you had a diffuse brain injury. And the analogy I often like to make is sort of like, um, not I use the United States since that's where um, I reside, um, but if you had an earthquake in the, in the, in the cornfields of Kansas in the United States, you will not have as many people injured and you will not have the global impact on the fight uh, or national impact on our economy as if you had that same level of earthquake in New York where even a block uh, may have very devastating effects on our economy. In regards to the brainstem and the hypothalamus, I'd like to talk about that as being operating systems for the automatic sort of control of our body. Um, and so very similarly to the electronic devices like Nest or Ring that sort of uh, run our houses these days and we don't need to really think about it. You have your hypothalamus that regulates your temperature, your, your um, you know, uh, sodium, your, um, you know, and, and, uh, and all the things that, again, we don't think about in terms of hormone controls and things like that. The brainstem I like to describe as having three floors. You know, your first floor is your midbrain, second floor is your pons, the medulla is your third floor. So that if you had injury to the bottom half of your brainstem, 
you would expect to see suck and swallow manifestations if that insult is more than a mild amount. If you injure the dorsal half, the back half of your brainstem, you're gonna have respiratory issues. And again, if it's more than a mild amount, that respiratory issue is likely to be a lifelong dependency in terms of uh, needing respiratory support and insistence. If you have midbrain insult, you will have pupillary responses or problems with visual fixation and tracking, which even a newborn should have some rudimentary abilities with. Recognize the brainstem is structurally less than one centimeter in diameter on a newborn. So that even with a three Tesla magnet with one millimeter slices, brainstem insults are still primarily a clinical diagnosis. So I need to see exam findings or dysfunction of um, to know if or suspect whether there is brainstem insult. So I will be looking for multiple different functional issues that would localize the insult to the brainstem. I wanted to expand a little bit on vision because I've had many parents who are very traumatized by a physician, including neurologists, telling them their child will never see. So recognize that um, unless you have complete injury to your calcarine cortex, your primary visual cortex, on both the left and the right and superior and inferior calcarine cortex, they will see. They may have visual field defects if they have partial injury, or they may have visual spatial or perception defects if they have occipital lobe or parietal lobe injury where you're injuring those association areas, but they will still see. It is very traumatizing to parents when they're told that their child will not see and then later discover their child can see. Um, because again, it's not about whether they see perfectly or normally, it's about whether they see at all. And again, remember that the optic radiations that go superiorly, inferiorly back towards your calcarine cortex, if they are also significantly injured, can have visual field effects. This is why with severe hydrocephalus, where you have uh, in particular severe enlargement of your occipital horn, that those kids will have lifelong cortical visual impairment because you've injured the telephone wires that go back to your visual uh, areas. Therefore, by knowing where in the brain that the injury is, that you can then understand what anatomic, uh, what the functional areas, those anatomic areas control, that you can then understand what modalities that partic your particular patient may have in the future. And then you need to gauge the signal intensity of injury in that area to say, or to be able to predict whether this will be a transient developmental delay issue versus a lifelong permanent disability and also how dysfunctional they will be in terms of needing lifelong assistance with daily activities of living. So you, I need an MRI to be able to know where that injury is and to localize it. But just like taking a picture of any accident, if you come across an accident uh, too early or too late and take a picture, it will not accurately demonstrate the severity of the injury and accident. And therefore, um, you will have reduced sensitivity and specificity in predicting the insult. And so it's when you get that MRI that will be very helpful in improving your prognosis. And you need to know enough about the sequences and what type of uh, sequences you can ask your neuroradiologist to do that may also enhance your sensitivity and specificity for De determining brain lesions, and then not just for HIE, but for neurodegenerative disorders, neurometabolic disorders, the pattern of, of the lesions and, um, and the locations of the insults can also help us in understanding the why. So in summary, in predicting dysfunctions, the key concepts are that anatomy is equivalent to function. Identify the location of injury a brain injury to predict the potential areas of dysfunction, gauge the severity of injury in each injured location to predict the likelihood of having a clinically significant or severe dysfunction of that functional modality, 
and then break down and discuss the prognosis in regards to this specific modality of function, such as awareness or consciousness, breathing, eating, vision, sleeping, walking, talking, seizures, or executive function issues or behavior management issues. I think that is much more helpful than using terms like moderate severe disability, which most lay people uh, and parents will have very little understanding for. Finally, I wanna talk about how to do a neurologic assessment or why that is important, especially an acute neurologic assessment for a newborn in a ICU that is undergoing an acute event. So one important concept is that no matter which metric or neurodiagnostic study you use, that serial time points of assessment is always going to be more sensitive and specific for gauging severity of injury or even the presence of injury than any single one time point. Because again, if you assume time of birth is time zero, and so therefore you're assuming that your investigation shortly after birth is accurate, but actually that baby sustained a subacute hypoxic ischemic event. And so you're actually assessing days to weeks later, then obviously your tools and your tests are gonna have different sensitivities and specificities. By having serial time points, you get a better idea of knowing where in the time course your patient is after their insult and whether this is a static chronic event uh, rather than an acute event. Your modalities of assessment are the same no matter what type of neurologic problem you have. You have clinical markers such as your exam or serum bio studies. You have neurophysiologic markers of which EEG and NIRS can be continuous modalities of assessing function. You have neuroimaging in the form of ultrasound, CAT scans, or MR imaging. We tend to prefer the ultrasound and MR in the NICU to avoid radiation. But obviously the gold standard is not what you see in terms of insults and injury, but what you do in the future that you're capable of. The example I often say is that I can take a picture of my hand and say, oh, you have, you're missing a fingernail here and why is that finger crooked? But from a picture of your hand, you cannot tell if that hand is capable of playing a piano. So an MRI and an any type of neuroimaging study is in uh, a picture showing you anatomy. And again, from anatomy, we can extrapolate function because we know different parts of the brain do different things. But just because you have a normal brain does not mean you're gonna be normal. There are plenty of adults walking around with normal brains who are not normal at all. Recognize the simplest test that I think is so underappreciated is the neurologic exam. You can repeat it as often as you want. There is no rule to say that you can only do it once. The charge is the same whether you do it once or uh, every 30 minutes. Obviously, most people don't like to do it every 30 minutes, and therefore, um, you can use other modalities to assess continuous function in the form of like EEG, AEG, or NIRS. And then obviously, as I stated before, always ask to see the brain. You never know what you, uh, who is truly normal or not until you look at their brain on MRI. This is why the American Clinical Neurophysiology Society in late 2011 indicated the two indications for getting continuous EEG wasn't just for seizures, but also for identifying and assessing encephalopathy we can tell from the EEG features whether this looks static or not, and, and even uh, the EEG patterns for encephalopathy for a child with channelopathy having epilepsy at, in the newborn age is very different from what we would see with an HIE event. And a subacute HIE versus an acute EEG has different levels of, of electrographic features. They look different. It's hard to uh, quantify it in a, a way that you can teach. It has to be something that I show you, sort of like saying, What's the difference between the zebra, mule, and a horse? They all look the same, but they're very different. Um, obviously, if you identify seizures on the EEG, um, you need the EEG to tell you whether you are in, um, if your therapeutic interventions are having effect, because once you add anticonvulsant medications, uh, the seizures become subclinical only and often briefer. And so therefore you need the EEG to let you know whether your intervention is successful or not.
it may be surprising, but I could, as a neurologist, I consider the placenta as a neurodiagnostic tool. Even ancient societies recognized that the placenta was very important in not just the prenatal, but the postnatal uh, life and outcomes of uh, the child. And um, unlike this quote, I often use uh, the analogy of saying that the placenta is the black box of the plane ride, the pregnancy uh, for the fetus. It may tell us what the fetus went through because it went through it together, or it actually may be the source of the etiology. And it may tell you what happened during the course of the pregnancy or just what went wrong in the last moments in the landing phase. The placenta is also more than just a organ to provide you blood flow, oxygen, and glucose. It is a neuroendocrine organ that is vital in forebrain development, something that we cannot replicate with TPN and interlipids and isolate. And so that no matter what society, uh, you know, uh, uh, country's uh, society of pathology, the recommendations have not changed for indications of obtaining a placenta, and it's strongly encouraged um, to, in, uh, to help explain any early or late maternal fetal uh, issues. This table illustrates the sort of the pros and cons of the different modalities for neuroimaging of ultrasound, CAT scans, or MRI. Obviously, um, for tissue resolution, we need the MRI when it comes to brain, um, looking at the brain, not just for brain injury, um, especially, you know, you, you could get away with a head ultrasound or a CT scan to look for gross evidence of injury. But the question is for subtle things like dysplasias or brain maturation, um, that mm -hmm. tissue resolution MRI provides is more useful. So that the reasons for obtaining neuroimaging are actually the same as for obtaining an EEG. It's to evaluate anyone at high risk or that you suspect of having sustained brain injury or to evaluate the newborn with seizures. Whether newborn or e anyone under the year of age, seizures are typically a remote or an acute symptomatic manifestation. And therefore, your yield is very high of finding neuroimaging abnormalities. Now, as a neurologist, I'm gonna also make a uh, believe that the neurologist is a neurodiagnostic tool. Um, I, we don't believe in being the primary service. I do not want to be managing the uh, ventilator or TPN orders on the newborn, um, but we can help uh, in, the in, the, um, in the aspect of being able to provide a different and broader perspective, uh, neurologic perspective of the patient, because obviously the diagnosis is much broader than just HIE, stroke, or, uh, you know, um, uh, um, intracranial hemorrhages in the newborn. There are neurogenetic uh, uh, disorders in the form of, of, of degenerative conditions, metabolic disorders, um, and also to help facilitate access to not only neurodiagnostic tools, but the other ne neurologic subspecialties that we engage with all the time. However, I recognize that not all centers are capable of having neonatal uh, neurologists um, as, um, there are several states in the United States that don't even have a child neurologist. Uh, for us, uh, when I first stepped in the NICU in 2004, um, you know, you can see that we had very few consults. In 2006, we ha I started brain cooling. We um, off do about 35 to 40 um, uh, cooling uh, infants a year, and we see about 80 to 90 seizure patients a year and performed at least 350 uh, continuous view to EEGs. However, of the over 900 babies that are transferred into our NICU, we're seeing about 250 to 300 consults a year. So they are not all HIE, stroke, or seizures. So in conclusion, none of us are normal. Uh, you know, even members of this audience, if you're a physician, your IQ is probably 120 to 140. That is two standard deviations above the norm, so you are not normal. Brain injury or issues can occur at any time or age, even before birth. Prediction of outcome should be based on what age the injury was acquired, location or locations of brain injury, and the severity of injury in each location. Prognosis should be discussed for each modality of function rather than using global injury scoring systems of mild, moderate, and severe disabilities, which are often vague and unclear to parents. Clinical symptoms and signs of dysfunction can appear and or change 
with the age of the patient because the brain is not the same at different gestational ages. Thank you. And um, I don't know if we're going to open for questions or should I just go on to our, my second talk? I think a question.